Well, welcome to CCV, everybody. I, I'm just so glad that you're here the first week of the year because we're going to kick off a series that, honestly, the teaching team believes this may have a greater impact on our church than any other series we do the entire year. We're talking about four vows that we can make in our lives. So let me introduce it this way. If I were not a Christian, but I still wanted to impact society in a positive way, you know the one thing that I would commit to, like the one crusade I would have? To protect marriage. Now, hear me out. Marriage is the foundation of the family, and family is the bedrock of society. And God knew that. And that's why, in the very first chapter of the Bible, before God ever established a government, a kingship, a military, a business, or even law, God ordained the institution of marriage. It is sacred for all of us. In fact, marriage, God knows this, is good for everyone. Whether you're married or not, you should join this campaign to protect marriage because it's good for society, but it's especially good for those who are involved in it. Men, men, if you're married, you will drink less, work more, and live years longer. Not bad. Ladies, if you're married, you will report a higher level of self-esteem, higher financial security, and greater sexual satisfaction. <laughs> Children whose mom and dad are married they do better in school, they get in trouble with the law less, and over their lifetimes, they will earn on average $61,000 more than their peers. Marriage is good for everyone, and that's why Satan hates marriages. I don't know if you've noticed here lately, but there is a full frontal cultural assault against marriage, and yet, good news, over the past 10 years, divorce rates have dropped significantly. Maybe you've heard that one out of every two marriages ends in divorce. That's not true. That has never been true. Here's as accurately as we can tell. According to the best Barner research, one in every three adults in America who have been married have been divorced at least once. So the baseline for divorce is actually 33%, not 50%. And here's some even better news. We now have a pretty good idea of what makes for healthy marriages. Well, things that give you a better chance for a better marriage. Here's three. Here's three. If you have a college degree, if you have a child after you're married, if you get married between the ages of 25 and 32, each of those raises your chance for a successful marriage by 24%. I know what you're thinking. Totally not helpful, that ship has sailed. <laughs> like I can't do anything about that now. Okay, okay, so here are two things you can do something about. I'm gonna give you two things right now that every person can do right here, right now, today and this month. You ready? Before I tell you that, I just want to recognize that some of you, your heart is beating really fast right now because your marriage is in trouble. I was reminded of this about a month ago. My wife and I were out at a community event and we were meeting a bunch of people who just came up and said, hey, we go to CCB, it's nice to meet you, well, it's great to meet you too. As we sat down, the couple in front of us, I swear they looked like a Hallmark card, just a picture-perfect family. And they said, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we go to CCV. 
I said, well, how long have you been coming? They said, well, just a few months. I said, interesting, what, what brought you here? And I thought, I didn't expect to hear what I, what I heard. I expected them to say, well, we had some friends, they told us about it, or we just moved into town and we you know, saw the bumper stickers. Here's what they said. We were getting divorced. Really? And that's why you came to see CCB? Yeah, and they're still married. They're fighting for their marriage and good for them. I think so many couples, this is your last stop before divorce court. I just want to tell you, fight for your marriage. It's worth it. And don't do it for me. Don't do it for the church. Don't even do it for God. Here's why you should fight for your marriage right now. I know it's hard. Divorce is harder. Five years after divorce, two-thirds of all couples regret getting divorced because they are still miserable. But those who fight for their marriage, five years after life was tough in marriage, five years after, two-thirds of those who stay married are glad they did. Your greatest chance of happiness is fighting for the relationship you have, not fighting to start from scratch. Stick with it. Would you please? Just, if you've come on any of our campuses and you're sitting here right now and you're, you're sweating and your heart is pounding because you know this is for you, would you give it one more chance before you throw in the towel? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you. Here's two things, two things that you can do that give you the greatest chance of marital success. Number one, if you practice your faith in Jesus Christ. Now notice, I did not say believing in Jesus, because believing in Jesus will not improve your marriage. It won't. Putting your faith into practice by reading the Bible, praying, and going to church together, that actually reduces divorce more than anything else we know. Christians who practice their faith by reading the Bible, praying together, and going to church, they practice their faith, they don't have a 33% divorce rate, it's actually 26%. That is a statistically substantial drop. There's another thing that you can do that's just as powerful, just as effective, and you don't need any faith to do this. Like anybody can do this. Couples who get marriage coaching reduce their divorce rates by 30%. You know what I've just described to you? In those two things. This is January at CCV, welcome to church. Because we're gonna provide for you four free marriage coaching for the next four weeks. This is good for people who are married, it's good for people who wanna be married, it's good for people who have been married, it's good actually for people who have never been married, here's why. We're gonna look at four vows. The vow we're gonna look at next week is the vow of partnership. Whether you're married or not, you've got partnerships. How to get along with people who are different than you. I, I know, women, you're weird. <laughs> you just are. Men, you're insane. We admit it. As the book says, women are from Venus, men are from Mars. How do you get along with someone who's different than you? That will help everybody. Don't miss it. The following week is the vow of passion. We're going to coach you how to have greater satisfaction in your sex life. I don't know about you. I will be there. <laughs> the final week is the vow of pursuit, how to date your mate. Again, great principles for singles, for married couples, for those divorced widows, just really good principles. So let's begin where it all begins. The vow of priority. This is where we start. So let me, let me begin by asking you this question. Who is your number one? In your marriage, who is Number one. Now, I gotta warn you, there's a myth in America that, that there's this a soul mate somewhere out in the cosmos, everyone has their soul mate. That is a bad idea. I don't mean to offend anyone, and I know how you feel that way, because everyone who falls in love, the very first time you feel like, I've, I've met the one. When I was 18 years old, I met my, my wife. I was playing football with a group of grungy guys out behind the dorm at the college, and I looked across the field, and I swear there was like a glow. 
There probably wasn't, but for me, it, it, I don't know if it was her halo or a rainbow, a couple of unicorns ran by. It was a moment. And I turned to the guy next to me and I said, I quote, who is that goddess? And he said, and I quote, that's my sister. <laughs> In that moment, I realized I could either get beaten to a pulp or I could trick him into introducing us. Wheels are turning and I said, dude, nothing that good looking will ever come out of your family. He goes, no, it's my, it's my sister. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Prove it. And he did. <laughs> the moment he introduced us, I'm telling you, it was magic. She fell in love with me. <laughs> That's the version of the story I'm going to tell you. Look, I get it why, why you feel like that, that's your soulmate, but even if I believe that, I would never preach that. Here's why. Marriage gets tough. Like if you've been married for, let's say, longer than a honeymoon, <laughs> you understand how tough it can be. And in the moments when she doesn't make you happy and he doesn't fulfill your needs, it's easy to say, oops, I married the wrong person. You're not my soulmate after all, and you go to try to find someone else. That is a tragic mistake. See, here's the problem that a lot of people make. You put your spouse on this pedestal and say, I want you to meet my needs. I want you to make me happy. I want you to fulfill my life. That's too much pressure for any human being. And here's the danger. A spouse that is idolized is ultimately demonized. And some of you live in that right now. And it's, honestly, it's not their fault. You put expectations on them that were overwhelming. No one can fulfill your deepest needs but God. Your deepest needs are met through your maker, not your mate. And until we put God at the center of our relationship, we're always gonna have turmoil in our closest relationships. So I wanna give you a principle that honestly, I think this is the single most important secret for happy, healthy marriages. And I'm gonna put it in a diagram because a picture is worth a thousand words. When you put God at the top of your triangle, your marriage will ultimately move in the right direction. Now, you may not even be a theist right now, but hear me out. The differences between a wife and a husband are often too great to bridge just by yourselves. But watch what happens in this spiritual geometry. It is inevitable that if the wife moves towards God and the husband moves towards God, you will always move toward one another. Your marriage with God at the center will ultimately get past your past and over your differences. So I, I wanna explore that just a little bit and remind you with this theological model of God at the center, your marriage has purpose. It is not just haphazard. God, God didn't create marriage for you. He created you for marriage. You were designed for this, to have this relationship, and there's three purposes that I want to explore. Number one, the purpose of your marriage is to help you experience God fully. Now let's unpack that a little bit. I told you, you don't even get out of the first chapter of the Bible before you hear God talking about your marriage. Verse 27 says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I, I picture it like this. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And they get together in verse 26 and say, hey, let's make us a man. Let's make us a humanity. A male and female will make them God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they went to work. And they created this human being. And in the male, God the Father started putting his characteristics. 
And in God, in the female, God the Holy Spirit started putting his characteristics. I don't know if you've noticed men and women are somewhat different, like really different. Women, here's some things that I think are so much, you, you are so much like the Holy Spirit. For example, new birth. In the Bible, it describes the Holy Spirit as God the Spirit interested in creating new birth. Well, obviously, you know more about new birth than I ever will. God the Holy Spirit is, is vicious for protecting families. That, that, that's so much like women. Here's another one. God the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit's number one capacity is, the number one skill set? Communication. Guys, not so much. On the other hand, you've got God the Father pouring into a man. Now look, women have some of these characteristics of God the Father and men have some of the characteristics of God the Spirit. I'm, I'm not saying it's absolute. I'm simply saying women lean more into the Spirit's characteristics. Men lean more into the Father's characteristics like justice and vision and dreams and honor. Much of what makes you a man is the characteristic of God the Father. Now, in my marriage, I'm crazy about my wife, and my wife drives me crazy. <laughs> I know it's a paradox, but it's true, and you laugh because it's true for you too. I'm crazy about her, but she drives me crazy. And what if, what if the very thing about that woman that drives me crazy is the character of God that I do not yet understand. Ladies, what if that thing about your husband, I'm not talking about sin or bad habits, but, the, but I'm talking about his character, his nature. What if the thing that drives you crazy is the very thing that you need to know about God? If you go back to the diagram, what if the character of your wife that drives you crazy is the very thing that will drive you toward God? Ladies, what if the very thing in your husband that drives you crazy is the very thing that will drive you toward God? Again, as you both move towards God, you will move towards one another. See, many people think that marriage is designed to make you happy. It's not. Marriage is designed to make you holy. And your happiness is a consequence of that holiness. That's purpose number one. Purpose number two is to help promote Christ clearly. And I'm just warning you, it's about to get weird all up in here. Because I'm going to read a passage of scripture from the Apostle Paul that is, well, you tell me. See if you can figure out what this verse is talking about. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Oh, you know what that is. We're talking about sex. I said it out loud right in church, sex. It's God's idea, it's really good, trust me. The very next verse continues to talk about sex when he says, this is a profound mystery. <laughs> well, I dare say. But I am talking about Christ and the church. What? I thought we were talking about sex and now you're talking about the church. Uh, Paul says, yes, both. Hello? Like, I don't know about you, but what my wife and I do in the bedroom is really different than what we do in church. I'm just saying. Physically speaking, there's no similarity. But spiritually speaking, there is one substantial similarity. And I know we're talking about sex, so if you need to giggle, go ahead. But I am dead serious on this. Where else do you go in the whole world where you can be naked and unashamed? Now look, I, I realize we all have body issues and I, I'm not talking about that. I'm simply saying my wife knows me better than anyone else in the world. I know her every inch. She knows about my scars. She knows about my flaws. She knows about my weaknesses and yet... She doesn't walk away, she is not repulsed, and she does not laugh. In fact, I've told her, babe, you can laugh at me in any room of the house except two. <laughs> Bedroom, bathroom, off limits, don't, don't laugh at me there, I'm fragile, come on. In our world, there's so much judgmentalism. 
so much hatred and so much bigotry. Everybody needs a safe place where you can be your complete self, totally transparent, completely authentic, and not fear rejection. It is so rare. And what Paul is saying is what happens in the bedroom, in, in that sense of total transparency and acceptance, in the, and it's not because you're flawless, it's in spite of your flaws, you're still loved and accepted. That is exactly what happens in this church. If you're new here, you just need to know this is a judgment-free zone. Nobody gets beat up, nobody gets bullied, nobody gets brutalized here because we want to model what happens in the, in the bedroom between the husband and wife is what happens with Christ and his church. You are welcome here. And when you open up your chest to God and say, hey God, here's who I really am. He is not repulsed. He does not run away. He wraps his arms around you and says, come my child, you're free and you're welcome here. Everybody needs that. And the power of your marriage is not its perfection, but in the imperfection of your marriage that you stick it out is a message that proclaims Christ to your friends and family who have no place like this. Fight for your marriage. The third purpose of your marriage is to help you change culture broadly. Back in Genesis, in fact, right after the verse we just read, verse 27, God tells Adam and Eve that he wants them to be fruitful and multiply. Let's read this passage. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over all, every living creature that moves on the ground. But you can fact check me on this. That's not just verse 28, it's in verse 26. Bracketing the creation account is God saying, hey guys, I want you to have babies. Here's why. God says, Adam and Eve, I want you to care for my garden. Prune the trees, take care of the plants, feed the animals. Adam and Eve are going, God, God this is a huge garden. There's only two of us. God says, I know, you better get busy. Every farmer knows the more kids you have, the better your crop. Now, we don't live in a garden anymore, but the, this principle applies everywhere we do live. In every society around the world, this isn't just Christian, in every society around the world, the people group that has the most babies and instills their values most clearly has the greatest cultural impact. I know that some of you don't have kids, some of you are single, there's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to be fixed or fixed up. I'm simply saying for those of you who are married and bear children, why do you think we spend so much time, energy, and effort to partner with you in our kids' ministries and our student ministries. It matters. Your greatest cultural impact is going to be through the next generation that you raise up to represent Jesus Christ in this world. I realize at this moment, Satan is livid. And even in your heart right now, he's gonna give you every excuse to walk away and ignore this marriage advice. And you may buy into it because ego makes excuses, love makes a way. Which is gonna win, your ego or love? So I wanna get tactical with you right now and practical, I'm gonna to talk to three people, husbands, wives, singles. Did I miss anybody? Good. Husbands, buckle up. Here's your question. Are you dying to yourself? The Apostle Paul, when he describes marriage, if you go back to the Ephesians account, chapter 5, verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, that's your job. And Jesus died for the church, but before he died for the church, he died to himself and lived for the church. And if you were gonna die for your, for your wife, you gotta live for her first. And look, a lot of guys are willing to die for their wife. I know I am. In fact, I now know I am. And I'm gonna tell you a story, please don't judge me. We were out to dinner with my wife and my kids 
and uh, we were just getting ready to sign the check, and I'm not gonna tell you what restaurant it was because at that moment, a bullet flew through one of the windows. It hit the wall, and like it fell on the table. I'm looking at the bullet. Everyone in the restaurant instinctively hit the ground, except for one knucklehead that gets up from the table, li literally walks to the door of the restaurant, is looking out to see who's shooting at him. That would be me. <laughs> I, and I know some of you are going, that is so irresponsible. I know my wife agrees with you. Back off. And don't, don't bother sending an email. This kind of stupid can't be fixed. So I, I'm just curious, like, who's shooting at us? And I figure once you pull the trigger, they're running away. So I'm out there looking at it. After all things were settled, we get in a car, we're going home. My wife is really upset. She's upset with me. Why would you go to the door? I said, what? She goes, someone could be coming in the door with a gun. I said, babe, that's exactly why I went to the door. If anyone's coming through that door with a gun to you, they're only gonna get to you over my dead body. I know it's so romantic, right? Look, look, look. <laughs> I, I'm not brave, I'm not courageous, it just happened. But I know this for a fact, I would die for my wife without blinking an eye. Men, is that true of you too? Oh yeah. Okay, so if I'm willing to die for my wife, why is it so hard to live for her? Why is it so hard to turn off the TV at dinner time? to put away the cell phone at bedtime, to, to walk away from the football game, to take my family to church. Why is it so hard for us to be men? Men, we need you to man up. This is your obligation and your God-given right to be the priest of your home. Men of CCV, we need you to be men of God who act for your wife as Christ did for the church, who raise your children in the Lord to maximize our cultural impact. We cannot reach this valley for Jesus Christ with the men in our homes being spiritual leaders in their homes. Ladies, you're next. Buckle up, because I'm not gonna be any more gentle with you. Here's your question. Are your actions louder than your words? Ladies, I know you love to talk. And you especially love to talk about the relationship. Most men would rather be hit in the head with a two by four. If you're willing to talk about the relationship, are you willing to live out your relationship with the Lord? That I'm not proud of this, but it is true. Men don't listen to women very well. We just don't. I apologize. But we watch you like a hawk. Listen to this marriage advice for women from the Bible 2,000 years ago. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe in the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me. And ladies, the most powerful thing you can do with your words is to not talk about your relationship. Here's the most powerful thing you can do with your words, to brag about your husband publicly. You want him to be a different man? Then you brag about the man he is to his friends. The worst thing you can do with your words is to criticize him publicly. That will destroy your relationship faster than any other single thing. Singles, your turn. You're not off the hook. Because all of this advice applies whether you're married, single, divorced, widowed. Singles, are you looking for someone on a pedestal or a platform? If you're looking for someone on a pedestal, someone who will meet my needs and make me happy, remember, just remember this, the person you idolize will ultimately be demonized. Rather, you should look for someone on a platform. Someone who is already doing the things that you want to accomplish, has your vision, your direction, your passions. I was listening to Craig Rochelle, one of my favorite preachers out of Oklahoma, and he told a story about a mother who had been praying for her daughter. Her daughter was a wild child, making some really poor decisions in life, dating the wrong kind of guys, 
And at one point, her daughter called her mom and said, Mom, I found the guy I want to marry. He is so good. And she started listing all his virtues. He's honest. He's got integrity. He's hardworking. He's funny. And her mother, this was not gentle. It was kind. Her mother said, Honey, if he is everything you say he is, then why is he interested in you? Singles, you gotta, you gotta bait for the mate that you want. When you go to catch fish, you, whatever bait you put on the, on the line is the kind of fish you're gonna catch. What bait's on your hook right now? Or in the words of Andy Stanley, here's my advice to you, become the person you're looking for is looking for. Whether you're single, married, divorced, or widowed, all of us need to take the same first vow. And I can't put words in your mouth. You have to say this yourself. But here's the takeaway. I vow to make God my number one. Now, let's get practical with this. It's no use just saying it. You have to live it. So here's one way that right now you could vow to make God number one. The two greatest things to improve your marriage is practicing your faith and getting good marriage coaching. We're gonna do that every week at CCV the entire month of January. So maybe your vow could have hands and feet by you talking to your spouse and saying, I want to be at CCV with you every single week this month to get the coaching that we need. Guys, our goal at CCV is to reach this entire valley for Jesus Christ. Your ability to make Jesus famous has its widest lane in your closest relationships. Let's make God our number one. Let's pray. Holy Father, we can't express enough our appreciation for this gift of marriage and sexuality and children. It was such a good idea. And it has such a powerful impact on our culture. So I pray for our great church in this great city that the men and women and singles of this church would take this good biblical advice to make you number one so that all of our relationships could fall in line with our greatest effectiveness for the sake and in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Great having you come, we'll see you next week.